Hello everyone, happy hump day. Welcome to Within the Frame, where we delve deeper into the top stories taking place not only in South Korea, but across the globe. I'm Kim bo -kyung. This week in North Korea, a key parliamentary meeting, the eighth session of the 14th Supreme People's Assembly, was slated to be held. Amid keen attention over Pyongyang and whether North Korean leader Kim Jong-un would attend the meeting and deliver a message towards South Korea or on its weapons development, the local media outlets stayed silent. Meanwhile, U.S. President Joe Biden and Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida recently held talks during which Washington showed support for Tokyo beefing up its military, showing the arms race in East Asia is just getting started. Now, what is North Korea up to now? And what role should South Korea play amid the escalating arms race in the region? For an in-depth analysis on the reclusive regime, we've invited to the studio Dr. Ko Myung-hyun, Senior Fellow of the Asan Institute for Policy Studies. Dr. Go, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. And we also have Raymond Pacheco Pardo, professor at King's College London, on the line from the UK. Professor, thank you for your time. Thanks for inviting me. All right, Professor Pacheco Pardo, though the Supreme People's Assembly is called North Korea's rubber stamp parliament, people's eyes are still focused on whether North Korean leader Kim Jong-un will deliver any message. Now, first of all, why is it called a rubber stamp and what kind of messages did Kim deliver in previous assembly meetings? Well, it is called a rubber stamp because obviously at the end of the day, power relies uh, with the Kim family and a small number of, of, of advisors. So North Korea, like uh, any other dictatorial regime, really, uh, they have an assembly that is basically there to um, approve whatever plans come from the leadership. There is no real debate. And, and we have seen in the past uh, Kim Jong-un delivering different uh, type of messages. Sometimes it was, of course, about the weapons program. Sometimes about, it was about the uh, domestic situation uh, in, in North Korea. So uh, we don't know what he's going to mention this year. We assume he's going to be talking about the uh, nuclear weapons and uh, missile program that North Korea uh, has. But as you were indicating, this is a very uh, opaque regime. So we'll have to wait and see. We'll have to wait and see what is reported by North Korean media. Uh, about the meeting uh, taking place. Right, Dr. Go. Mm -hmm. uh, based on what North Korea said before, the parliamentary meeting yeah. was supposed to be held on Tuesday, yeah. which was yesterday. I mean, given that North Korea media outlets, you know, usually carry their reports on the next day yeah. after the event is held, many observers are wondering whether it has been postponed yeah. or if it is being held for two days. Yeah. Now, what are your thoughts on this? And is two-day event a usual one? So actually, there's nothing really unusual about this kind of postponement or, or like a delay uh, mm -hmm. in the holding, holding the, the, the assembly meeting. And it has happened before. Uh, actually, it happens almost every year. Uh, for instance, last year, the same thing happened. Uh, North Korea, back in September, North Korea announced that they'll have a two-day meeting. And then there was, a, I mean, the, there was no report about, you know, that the meeting came coming out right afterwards. And, and um, uh, previously, there's been actually even uh, unannounced uh, postponement for three days because Kim Jong-un didn't show up, for instance. Mm. So the reason why this is happening is because unlike the name, name indicates it's a very important bo political body in North Korea, Supreme People's Assembly, it is actually, you know, like a Professor Pacheco Parado indicated it's a rubber stamp uh, mechanism. So it, these days it's acting more like a stage uh, for the North Korean leadership, particularly Kim Jong-un, to project uh, his ideas and his, uh, I mean, the, the image of himself as uh, ruler of North Korea. And also sometimes this is also a platform to make uh, important policy announcements. But it doesn't mean that uh, these policy announcements have been decided at the assembly meeting. It's just mm -hmm. that the, the background, the theatrics, and uh, the visuals of uh, having many delegates gathered together in a, in a mag magnificent uh, location uh, projects more like uh, importance. I think uh, that's something that the North Korea has in mind. So in that sense, it's more of a propaganda platform mm -hmm. rather than a real political body. Right, so it, mm. we shouldn't be really surprised to see if it's delayed or it doesn't, mm. it doesn't exactly. get held. Mm. Right, now, Professor Pacheco Pardo, the next big day on the calendar is actually February 8th, the 75th anniversary of the founding of the Korean People's Army. Now, if Kim Jong-un does not attend the meeting at all, could we say that he is rather focusing on preparing the events for that day? And if so, do you expect any provocation that might take place around that time? 
there has been a speculation about it. They may not be uh, directly linked uh, in the sense that uh, Kim Jong himself, obviously, he makes the big uh, policy announcements. Uh, but when it comes to the detailed preparation of this meeting, uh, we have seen in the past that maybe he's more keen to delegate to those who are close to him, including his sister, uh, for example. Uh, what I do think, though, is that obviously in North Korea, it always does this. Uh, it has to deliver, or Kim Jong himself has to deliver different messages in different settings. Uh, so it is true that uh, Kim Jong Un may be thinking what message they want to deliver uh, during this meeting, what message they want to deliver uh, next month, uh, and, and then moving moving forward. Uh, we don't know how the regime exactly operates. We don't have the inside information. Uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if, 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 if this is the case, uh, because we have seen in the past North Korea uh, on an annual basis very clearly choreographing its messages and thinking very carefully about what message is going to deliver first to domestic audiences, but also uh, to foreign audiences in each of these important gatherings that take place every year. Right. Well, moving on to Dr. Ko, we do know, however, that mm. several of the items on the agenda for mm. the parliamentary meeting, one is matters involving the Central Prosecution mm. Office, and another was adopting a law to protect mm. the uh, Pyongyang dialect. Mm. What are these two for, and could we say such items on the agenda show that Pyongyang is trying to tighten its grip over its people? Oh, well, that's exactly what's going on, uh, mm. even though the uh, the items on the agenda, such as the Central Prosecutor's Office, as well as uh, protecting the Pyongyang uh, dialect in North Korea, sound rather innocuous or even innocent. Uh, that truth is not the case. Uh, North Korea has been passing laws and measures to stamp out uh, the influence and the spread of uh, South Korean and cultural uh, products. Uh, such as uh, TV dramas and movies and music. Uh, there, I mean, recently there's been a, a public uh, not demonstration, but public uh, uh, event where uh, people who have been accused of watching and listening to South Korean music and dramas have been uh, actually publicly ashamed and then have to essentially issue a mea culpa for using, I mean, uh, be, uh, look, uh, looking at uh, South Korean uh, uh, dramas and uh, cultural products. So North Korea has been in a, in a, in a campaign to uh, push out this kind of influences. And Kim Jong-un himself has uh, denounced uh, the corrupting effect of a South Korean culture in North Korea. So the Central Prosecutor's Office is a part of a North Korea's political, uh, no, sorry, just justice reform to essentially, as you indicated, uh, tighten the grip on the society to so-called uh, increase the internal cohesion, which translates to increasing the level of oppression in the North Korean society. It's hard to imagine for us to, to uh, how North Korea could uh, increase the level of internal control from what is already already pretty high level of internal operation, but that's indeed the case. North Korea wants to essentially control the thoughts of the people, uh, even more so than before. So I think uh, uh, it's very indicated that uh, North Koreans are discussing this issue at the Supreme uh, uh, People's Assembly this time, and it means that the North Korea's uh, domestic agenda for this year probably less about economy reform or opening, it'd be more about social control. Right, so it is part of an effort to, uh, you know, put, pull all the domestic audiences away from such overseas mm. influence. Right, uh, Professor Pacheco Pardo, overall, it seems North Korean leader Kim Jong-un is focusing on maintaining the regime's power through repressive measures. And some say this is because more and more elites and young people are becoming disillusioned with the regime. What is your take on this? Uh, well, Professor Ko was, was right. We have seen this... Uh, announcement of uh, repressive measures being taken by the uh, North Korean regime. Uh, I think a few years ago when we saw the summits between the two Koreas, also between the US and, uh, and North Korea, there was a hope that maybe the, the regime was willing to open up uh, even if slightly economically and that, that, that therefore uh, maybe social control, some of them would be removed. Uh, but we have seen that this is not the case. And we have seen also that with COVID, North Korea has taken advantage of this situation to tighten control uh, over its borders, uh, obviously the border with China as well, but also flights going into uh, Pyongyang. So we've seen that there is this increasing social control uh, within the country. The reports coming out uh, indicate uh, this. Uh, we see, for example, the number of refugees from North Korea being able to leave the country to make their way, for example, to, to South Korea. This has decreased dramatically over the past few years. 
um, in, in, in relation to his uh, COVID-related uh, controls. And uh, I'm pessimistic myself in the short run that North Korea will move in the opposite direction. I don't see any incentives really for the Kim regime to say, okay, let's try to to, to think, not even out opening up economically, but maybe removing some of the social controls that in the past uh, we thought at some point uh, may be gone. Uh, and I do think as well that this is related obviously, to the changing character of uh, North Korean society and the fact that probably the North Korean regime feels that this is a, a threat. Um, we're not talking about revolution here, but if more and more people start to think that uh, countries such as South Korea, but also China, for example, are more developed, have a, a cooler culture as well than their own country, obviously this would be seen as a threat uh, by the North Korean regime as foreign influence encroaching in the country. Right, right. Uh, Dr. Go, shifting gears a little bit, the UN chief Antonio mm -hmm. Guterres called Pyongyang's nuclear weapons pro uh, program as unlawful. Mm -hmm. And to this, North Korea denounced it by mm -hmm. saying the DPRK is nuclear weapons state mm -hmm. and that it will remain as unreasonable and stark mm -hmm. reality. Now, considering such words and phrases, could we say that North Korea is firm that it is not willing to return to the negotiating table regarding the denuclearization issue? Well, well, I, I mean, clearly North Korea came out very strong to reaffirm that uh, North Korea is now a nuclear state. And, but then that's been you know, a very consistent message on the part of North Korea for a while now. And, and I think uh, the, re the reason why North Korea uh, reacted strongly to uh, the, the words of a uh, UN Secretary General, uh, and who just reaffirmed what the no uh, United Nations Security Council have been saying about uh, North Korea's missile test and nuclear test since uh, 2006. And, and so it's in a way, it's a very typical remark, nothing controversial about it. Uh, it's actually written in the re, uh, every single UN resolutions mm -hmm. on North Korea. And I think North Korea used this occasion to uh, send a message, uh, reaffirm the message that they are not going to give up the nuclear weapons. Uh, so what it means is that uh, diplomatically, North Korea might be willing to negotiate or to engage in dialogue with the outside world. But then the focus of the, such dialogue will be not about North Korea's denuclearization, that's what North Korea wants to say, but they might be willing to negotiate in other issues. Uh, for instance, how to recognize North Korea as a nuclear mm -hmm. state, because there are different ways to do so. Uh, this is the official way, and, and that's very controversial because, uh, because the non-proliferation treaty, there are only five official nuclear states in the world right now. Uh, these are basically the permanent members of the Security Council, uh, but then, uh, North Korea probably wants uh, some sort of unofficial recognition of their status as a nuclear power uh, just by removing sanctions against the country. Mm -hmm. And that's something that North Korea is very much willing to discuss, but that's an, at the same time, it's not something that the international community is willing to discuss with North Korea. So there's a lot of uh, back and forth going on, and we can say that, that this has been the, the back and forth that the international community has had with North Korea, uh, at least for the last 10 years. And it's likely that it's going to continue to do so. Uh, but then the problem for North Korea is that even though they have a very strong tight control over the North Korean uh, society. Uh, the people, even though they're suffering economically, they cannot even think about uh, rising up against the regime. The problem is that, uh, that they need, uh, in a way, acknowledgement from the international community. And this, they have no much control over that. Uh, so if the international community, despite all the uh, test provocations and harsh words coming out of Pyongyang, decides not to recognize North Korea's nuclear mm -hmm. state, then North Korea will have to just sit and wait. So that's a dilemma. And I think, uh, I think this dilemma is going to get worse this year for the North Korean regime. Right, so eventually we'll have to wait and see what happens and what decision North Korea mm -hmm. tries to make. Now, Professor Pacheco Pardo, though the UN Secretary General himself said the onus is on North Korea to come back to talks, since North Korea doesn't seem to have any will to for now, what kind of measures should the international community come up with to break this stalemate? Uh, at this point, it seems a bit difficult. I agree with what Professor Koya said, that North Korea is not going to give up its nuclear weapons. It has made clear the negotiation is not on the table. So the starting point of the negotiation process for the international community, especially the U.S., of course, uh, would be putting denuclearization on the table. Now, since this is not going to be the case, unless uh, there is a change in thinking in the U.S., other countries say we're going to focus on issues such as 
freezing the development of the uh, nuclear program. Uh, we're going to focus, for example, on arms control. Uh, unless there is this change in thinking, it becomes difficult to see what's the starting point of negotiations uh, with North Korea. Uh, some experts have called for compartmentalization. So, so let's discuss nuclear weapons separately from economic issues, separately from human rights, for example. But I don't think uh, that the US and other countries are willing to uh, engage in this uh, process of separating different issue areas when it comes to discussions uh, with North Korea. And they all come together, and we have seen, especially in the past, that when it comes to any potential economic support for North Korea, this is linked to uh, the country taking the steps towards denuclearization. So what I think we're going to see is uh, a growing a strengthening of the deterrence capabilities uh, that the U.S. Uh, is uh, deploying or indicating it may deploy in the Korean Peninsula and the surrounding area. Of course, South Korea beefing up its military capabilities as well as the deterrent uh, against North Korea, uh, in the hope that this may lead the North Korean regime to, to potentially consider at least sitting down uh, to talk to, to, to both of them. But uh, I do not think that uh, the ball, so to speak, is on the court of the international community. I really think it's on, uh, on, on the court of, uh, of, of North Korea, of the Kim uh, family, and that Kim Jong-un has to decide at some point if he wants to continue with uh, his country being as uh, isolated as it is today, of course, dependent on, on Chinese and to an extent Russian uh, economic support, but very, very isolated at the, at the international level, or whether he wants to move in, an, in a different direction, which will imply, for example, more recognition for North Korea as an international actor. Right. Professor Patekopardo, I'd like to also tap on the trilateral alliance uh, amid, you know, uh, the United States, Japan and South Korea. U.S. President Joe Biden and Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida actually held bilateral talks last Friday. And there, Biden said the U.S. is fully, thoroughly and completely committed to the alliance and that and hailed Tokyo's new national security strategy and beef up in uh, defense spending. Now, it seems like the arms race in East Asia region is accelerating very much. How do you see the situation developing in this region right now? I, I think it will continue. Uh, I was not surprised, obviously, about uh, President Biden supporting Japan um, and his new strategy and, and his growing military spending. Uh, I found very interesting, though, that uh, President Jun actually made the point that it may be inevitable uh, for Japan to, to continue to build up its military capabilities, considering the situation in the region, because to me, this shows that we are reaching an understanding, not only between the US and Japan, but also between uh, South Korea and, 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 and Japan, that there are two big threats in, in the region, uh, which are obviously North Korea uh, and, and, and China, to an extent Russia as well, of course, uh, and, and that we're going to see this uh, growing military spending by the countries that are closest. Uh, to the U.S. and, of course, uh, Northeast Asian military buildup doesn't happen in, in a vacuum. We're seeing more cooperation between uh, Korea and Indonesia, for example, uh, Korea and, and Japan and the Philippines as well. So it's all the countries uh, surrounding, really, China uh, that feel threatened by it and that they feel that they need to strengthen their uh, military capabilities, but also their um, bilateral or minilateral uh, relationships. Uh, we're seeing, for example, uh, in the case of South Korea, uh, and Vietnam. Uh, we're seeing increasing cooperation and there is even talk about are we going to formalize this uh, cooperation that is taking place, some would say, in a very uh, ad hoc basis. So I, I don't think this is going to, uh, to diminish. Uh, also considering, of course, that after Russia's invasion of Ukraine, many countries, not only in East Asia, but across the world, are thinking, look, we have to protect ourselves because this may happen to us. This has happened in Europe. We thought it was unthinkable. This could happen in other regions as well. Right. I mean, in line with that, Dr. Go, according to Pyongyang state media on Wednesday, Kim Jong-un mm. sent uh, New Year's cards mm. to Chinese President Xi Jinping and Russian leader mm. Vladimir Putin. With an arms race developing in the region, what kind of ally is North Korea viewing China and Russia as? And how is uh, such relationship going to develop within the year? Well, North Korea wants to project this image that uh, uh, it's actually a full-fledged part of a trilateral uh, alliance mechanism between, mm -hmm. uh, among China, Russia, and North Korea. 
But then I think that's an exaggeration of the relationship that they have. Uh, so we tend to think in the symmetric terms all the time. So since we have a very strong trilateral security coordination and alliance between Seoul, Tokyo, and Washington, we imagine that the North Korea would like to have the same mechanism or framework or even structure on their side. So they, uh, so all observers naturally attribute this kind of uh, gestures uh, from North Korea to, uh, to you know, the leaders of China and Russia that uh, this is a formation or sign of formation of a, of a, a trilateral mechanism on the part of North Korea, China, and Russia. But that's not the case. Uh, only thing that ties the city, these three countries together, despite uh, the fact that historically uh, they had uh, in common the, the common ideology of socialism and communism. What ties them together right now is very simple. It's anti-Americanism. Uh, China is trying to uh, push out the American influence in, the, in East Asia. Russia, obviously, is uh, fighting uh, uh, like uh, Ukraine. And at the same time, uh, they believe that they're fighting NATO. And North Korea, obviously, has an ongoing confrontation with the United States. So this uh, element of anti-Americanism ties this country together. But then beyond that, they have a very disparate interest. And then they are, in, at the same time, they are very different countries in the mm -hmm. sense that, uh, I mean, China and, I mean, despite the fact that China and North Korea, they share uh, uh, you know, historical solidarity and also uh, ideology uh, at a moment in time. Uh, if you compare the level of a social control and economic development between China and North Korea, they are very, uh, very different countries. And so it's difficult to imagine uh, China, North Korea, and Russia to form a level of integration that uh, we see on our side uh, with, uh, so, uh, with Korea, Japan, and the United States. We have a very close uh, policy con consultation mechanisms. Mm -hmm. We have uh, actually a very strong economic supply chain integrations. We have very close uh, trade relationships. We don't see any of that. The trade between China and North Korea, we're talking about millions of dollars per year. Uh, for us, uh, whereas for with, between South Korea, Japan, and the United States, we're talking about trillions of dollars. So these are the qualitative differences between the two sides. So I think uh, we shouldn't uh, put too much meaning to these mm -hmm. kinds of gestures. Just that though, I mean, because they have a common interest of opposing uh, the liberal international order, democracies, and the United States uh, around the globe. Uh, there are some uh, tacit coordination, implicit coordination that these countries moves, but then uh, we shouldn't read too much into this, in my, it's, that's my opinion at least. All right, very interesting. Uh, unfortunately, this is all the time we have for today's edition, but thank you, Dr. Go, for your insights. And of course, thank you, Professor uh, Pachetta Pardo, for your time, we really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you. All right, that's all for Within the Frame tonight. We'll be back tomorrow with more in-depth stories on the issues happening in South Korea and, of course, around the globe. Thank you for watching and enjoy a great evening. Goodbye.